Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 40th session of Virtual Shadowing. Today's session is Family Medicine and Lifestyle with Gabriela DeVita, a PAC. As always, you can contact us on Instagram at Virtual Shadowing or through our email, which is virtualshadowing at gmail.com. These sessions will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel, which is Pre-Health Virtual Shadowing. Next slide, please. Here are our upcoming sessions. So next week, we have a specialty spotlight in plastic surgery. The week after that, we have a specialty spotlight in internal medicine and pediatrics. And the following week, we have a specialty spotlight in orthopedic surgery. Also, our specialty spotlight in cardiology was rescheduled for the 25th. Join us on Zoom or YouTube Live at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time for these sessions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here's the virtual shadowing working group comp comprised of Reagan, Cheyenne, Taylor, Elena, Rachel, Ani, Miriam, and myself, as well as our physician providers, Dr. Dr. Morchetti, Dr. Salazar, and Dr. Reno. And on the next slide, we have a quick announcement from Reagan. Hi, everyone. Uh, just wanted to give a quick announcement for this week. Um, we've gotten a few emails from students using their university email addresses. And if you have not received an email from <laughs> us or a welcome email, um, it's very likely that your school's email address is blocking our emails. So I would suggest re-signing up on our website using a personal email address like Gmail or Yahoo or something like that. And then my second announcement is about QuestBase. So for the upcoming quiz session 40, I would recommend if you cannot download the certificate, try taking the assessment on your phone and try um, getting your certificate that way. A lot of students have been able to download it that method. So thank you, Rohit, and I will hand it back to you. All right, next slide, please. So as always, we will have two Q&A sessions, one near the middle of the presentation and one at the very end. This session will be about an hour and a half to two hours. And so if you have any questions about the quiz, please hold them to the, till the very end. And we also have a quick announcement from Dr. Fowler. Well, it's great to have you all here once again for our 40th session. My goodness, how quickly this has gone by. We've been, here, we've been with you now almost 10 months and uh, we're just delighted to, to have you here. Uh, I had over 46,000 uh, clicks have come in of people signing up representing over 39,000 people. And so uh, it's phenomenal. Um, 28 nations, over 950 universities. So we're, we're really glad to be here. We're trying to, uh, come summer, we'll have been here a year, and we'd, we'd love to hear from you if you'd like us to keep going. Uh, we will have by then probably something in the range of about 50 lectures and 100 hours of shadowing online. And so if you'd like us to keep going, put it in chat, send us a note um, at the virtual shadowing email. Uh, Brody, <laughs> you, you, you look at you in chat. Oh, that warms my heart. Well, look at that. <laughs> I hope all of you are seeing that. Well, thank you. That's, that's very sweet. If you want us to keep going, and if you'll keep coming back, we'll keep going. Um, um, and so anyway, thank you so much. That was awfully sweet. So let me turn to my uh, partner in crime, uh, Dr. Gil Salazar, who works with me at Parkland ER. And Gil has been putting together the Virtual Clinical Observation Program, VCOP, V-C-O-P dot W-S. So Gil, you wanna take it away for a minute? Yeah, for sure. Hi guys, um, I've probably met most of you. My name is Gil Salazar. I am a Dr. Fowler's a colleague at UT Southwestern and also an educator myself. When you guys um, asked us to give you more, we gave you more. So we created a virtual shadowing sister program, virtual clinical observation program. I'll put the website and my Instagram uh, on, in the chat. It's a different format, uh, case-based with uh, recordings in a pretty robust Q&A with, with faculty. So just to get, let you guys know, we're registering people currently at our session, our second session last uh, Thursday. And upcoming episodes are gonna include a pediatric burn recording uh, that we did, which is gonna be amazing. Uh, we're also gonna be dedicating one of the lessons 
on my father's myocardial infarction, his heart attack with uh, including pictures. And if you guys behave themselves, I may see if my dad wants to come in and say hello during the uh, session. And don't forget that we are launching our podcast uh, in the spring and our very first podcast is going to be medical missions. Are they worth it for pre-health? So I'm going to put in the info in the chat. Hope to see as many of you as we possibly can. We've registered almost 1,200 of you so far. So uh, look forward to seeing you. Thank you. So Rohit, um, introduce our uh, wonderful speaker for the evening who now has almost 600 people just sitting on the edge of their chairs ready for it to take off. Okay, one quick reminder before that. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. Uh, don't direct message them to me or to the presenter tonight. Uh, and with that said, uh, everyone, please welcome Gabriela DeVita. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, all right. So thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about my journey to becoming a physician assistant and a little bit of what I did before. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some case studies. It's going to Let's get rid of okay. So, um, yes, yeah, this is what we'll go over. I um, have put in a good presentation for you guys. I hope that you enjoy it. So, first of all, I will add here, I am originally from Venezuela. So, I started my undergrad um, back in 2000. Um, 2008. Um, I did a few years over there, about three years or so, and then I transferred to the U.S. I moved to Miami. Um, some of my credits were validated and some of them weren't, so I ended up graduating um, from undergrad in 2014. Um, so, oh, let me just back, back up here a little bit. When I did my undergrad, which was in nutrition and, nutrition and dietetics. I did so because I knew I wanted to go into healthcare, but I wasn't necessarily um, looking to be a physician or to um, you know, be in the process of, of diagnosis and treatment. Um, I just knew that I wanted to be in healthcare and I wasn't exactly sure of what that was. Um, so. I actually had the opportunity to, um, there's a little side story here. When I graduated high school, I had the opportunity to go to Utah as an um, as a international student with a host family. And when I was there, I was able to shadow and do an internship with a family dentist and an endodontist, because I also thought I maybe liked um, you know, to go down that route. And I discovered that I hated it. I did not like it a single bit. Um, but in my senior year in high school, I had a, one of my professors was a dietitian and she talked a bit, uh, you know, she talked to us about what her profession was and um, a lot about the role of nutrition, not only in, uh, you know, when it comes to health and fitness and weight loss and things like that, but she actually had, um, she had several different uh, jobs at the hospital and the, her input in the disease process and being part of the healthcare team was huge. So I thought, oh, maybe that sounds, you know, sounds <clears throat> very interesting. So I just decided to give it a try. And so in 20, or 2008, when I started my undergrad, um, the first year we had anatomy, we had cl um, classical introduction to dietetics, uh, foundations of nutrition, and <clears throat> sorry. I just fell in love with the profession, um, and so I just kept going. So when I moved to the US, my purpose or my, my goal was just to finish my um, undergrad and start working as a dietitian. Um, so when I did and I graduated in 2015, my first job was as an outpatient dietitian in a diabetes during pregnancy program. And <clears throat> that job, I'm sorry, I'm, I really need to drink some more water. <laughs> and 
I was at that job for about three years before I decided that I wanted to go to PA school. Um, that job was really an amazing job because most of my patients, it was a very specific, very narrow um, scope of practice, you could say, or field, because all of my patients, or like 95% of my patients were pregnant women with diabetes. But um, because I was working in at the Department of Maternal Fetal Medicine, I would also receive uh, consults for patients that you know were pregnant and simply wanted to meet with a dietitian or that maybe had other conditions like hypertension um, and they needed a little bit of assistance with their diet. Um, that job is when I first met at PA. And as the years went by, which wasn't a whole lot because I was only there for about three years. Um, I just started to feel very um, limited in my scope of practice. And so I eventually became a CDE, which is a certified diabetes educator. And that allowed me to expand a little bit more. Um, we'll talk about more about what I was able to do. Um, but eventually I still felt very limited. So then in 2017, um, when I met this PA and I started kind of researching the profession and networking, shadowing, I decided to go that route. And in 2018, I started PA school at the University of Detroit Mercy, and I just graduated last um, summer in August. So 2020, I graduated, took and passed my exam and started my first job, which was or is in family medicine. So, um, I, I guess I mentioned a little bit of this already, sorry for the background noise. Um, I became a dietitian um, because of the involvement in, as, as part of the healthcare team, you are part of the multidisciplinary team. And yes, there is a huge focus on health promotion and disease prevention, but you are also able to work in different uh, fields, not only in, medicine, like in healthcare, so at the hospital um, or outpatient clinics, but there's other um, areas such as companies, uh, pharmaceuticals with the government, um, the food industry. So there seemed like there was a huge amount of opportunity. Um, now, this is a little bit different from, you know, when I first started in Venezuela, but here in the U.S. to become a dietitian, you uh, would have to go through a bachelor's degree at an accredited university. And then you complete about 12 months or so, or somewhere between six and 12 months of um, clinical or supervised practice program. So like rotations, and those are usually in about four focus areas. So you have a rotation at the hospital, um, you have a community, community um, a program rotation, and then there is the food service portion, and long-term care is one that some programs have. Um, I don't think all of them are required to have it. I think it's an optional, but that's one of the ones I had. And then you have to sit down for a national exam, like a lot of our careers in medicine. So this one is the CDE exam. And some states, most of the states actually do require licensing as well, which is another um, another exam that you would have to take. I was very lucky I didn't have to take that exam because Michigan is actually, I believe, like the only state that doesn't require that. So I only took my CDR exam. And then you have to keep on continuing education credits. So as I was saying, these are some of the um, fields that you could find a dietitian. So the hospital, which is where I worked, uh, but sports nutrition, um, which is a very, very fun area to work if you like sports. I have some of my friends that um, they work with uh, sports teams at universities or even at the state level. And there are also, you can start your private practice, work with the community or public health setting, the university research. Um, and as I said, I didn't put it here, but well, food and nutrition, business industries, pharmaceuticals. So for me, at the Diabetes and Pregnancy Program, I provided education 
for women with diabetes who were pregnant. And this was from type one diabetes um, or type two or gestational diabetes, meaning that they were diagnosed with it just during the pregnancy. And so I did one-on-one -on -one education, uh, group classes. And as I gained a little bit more experience in my CDE certification, then um, I started also to manage blood sugars. So we would start patients on medication and adjust the medicine based on you know, their blood sugar levels. Um, I educated them patients also on how to start insulin and inject insulin and then follow up with them. So I had a lot of uh, flex or, uh, I forgot the term, um, uh, privileges with my supervising physician. So that was very nice. And that's actually what sparked my interest in, you know, looking for uh, options to expand. So then as a CDE, which this used to be the term, now we have a new title, is Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist. It's a very long credential. Um, I love this credential because there is an abundance of patients with diabetes out there and it, we, you know, we learn about diabetes in school and in med school or in PA school. Sometimes it just feels like it's so little that we learn and there is so much out there, like every day almost, you feel like there's a new diabetes medicine. Um, and there is just so much more that goes into diabetes management that a provider usually typically doesn't have time to go over. So even for me now that I'm a PA and I'm also a diabetes educator, I don't always have the time to sit down with my patients and go over all the things that I would have if, if my job was only to be their diabetes educator. So I have a huge appreciation for, um, you know, nurse and dietitian diabetes educators, but this is a credential that a lot of health professionals can um, obtain. So nurses, dietitians, pharmacists, PAs, doctors, um, what you would need to, this is just a little bit of you know, extra information, but what you would need is two years of experience working at your profession. And then um, you have to have some type of diabetes exposure. So like it was pretty easy for me because that was the field that I was working on. But if you're say in family medicine and you have a lot of patients with diabetes, that counts towards your your hours that you're required. Um, and obviously some continuing education credits and then another exam, like everything is an exam. Um, so I obtained this certification and I plan on keeping both of my certifications as long as they are useful for the field that I'm working on. Um, but, which is now family medicine, when I made my decision to go for, uh, to become a physician assistant, like I said earlier, it was because I was feeling very limited in my scope of practice, even as a, a dietitian and a diabetes educator. Um, even though I was having a lot of fun and I really, really love my job working with the patients and providing patient education, adjusting the insulin, um, you know, going, working with the patients through the entire pregnancy, especially if they had diabetes before, and then <clears throat> seeing them deliver a healthy baby. That was a very uh, like gratifying job. But when my patients asked me about um, their high blood pressure or, you know, maybe their kidney disease that they also had or problems with their, some other aspect of their pregnancy, I had to redirect them to their provider because that wasn't my job. I didn't have the knowledge. Um, you know, I didn't have the skills or anything to answer that question. And I, it started to happen so often that I, I just kind of wish that I had that um, a role in their care. And so at that point, and like you said, I was never interested in, in going into med school. But in Venezuela, we don't have... Is, is if either you know you become a nurse or or a doctor, um, and then there are other professions like pharmacy and dentistry and dietitian, but you don't have like nurse practitioner or a PA, and so 
I don't know, at, at that time, it worked perfectly. But around that time that I was trying to see what else I could do, um, I met a PA that started working at our clinic. And I had no idea of what she was, what her role was. Um, so I started to get consults from her. And then I started to see consults from another nurse practitioner. And a friend, and this is actually very funny because, um, not, not a friend, but one of my coworkers, she said, oh, you could become a PACDE. You would be great. I was like, oh, well, let me look into that. So I started talking with this uh, PA and in doing my research and, and talking with her, I realized um, the wide scope of practice and, and this meaning kind of goes with the lateral mobility, but um, that you can work in different fields of medicine, which is something that I really like because in my, when I was, you know, as a dietitian, I would, I thought, well, I could do diabetes, then I could work um, in a dialysis clinic, and then I could also do um, weight loss or bariatric surgery and just kind of switch through different fields. And as a PA, that's something that I could continue to do, but with um, more of an, you know, a, a wider scope of practice with in an, an higher role in the patient care. Um, also, the collaborative environment between, you know, the relationship between PAs and the supervising physicians and having somebody there um, that is very experienced and um, very knowledgeable to help help you out when you need to, um, you know, discuss cases or things like that. It just seemed like a great profession. So, and the other thing I added here is very important to me was the education to practice timeline because I already had my career at that point and I personally didn't really want to, you know, stop working for too long before I was able to go back to work. And so with PA, it's a master's program that's two to three years. So that was very appealing to me as well. A lot of you might be familiar with this already, um, but if not, um, PAs are also medical professionals and PAs diagnose, develop management and or management and treatment plans, and we prescribe medicine, interpret and order labs. Um, we are in a lot of different uh, fields, as I was saying, and very versatile, help increase access to healthcare. And a lot of the times, patients will mostly see a PA because I like to say it as you know we're extenders of the physician services, so. When a physician might see, you know, 30, 40 patients now with their PAs, we can access care and we can see a lot more patients. Um, so these are some of the fields that, and settings that you can see PAs, hospitals, urgent cares, outpatient clinics, um, and then all kinds of subspecialties as well. So what does it take to become a PA? First, you complete your bachelor's degree, which the beautiful thing about this is that it can be in anything that you want. Um, one of the things that I like about the profession is that they really, they welcome career changers like me. So, uh, you know, I, in my class, we had, we had two, uh, two of my classmates were dancers. We had a teacher, um, like a high school teacher. We had an accountant. So people with huge, you know, huge different in backgrounds and not everybody uh, was already in, in the medical field. And then with that, though, you have to make sure to meet the minimum course requirements. So it kind of varies by school, but it goes into like the anatomies and the physiologies and chemistries, um, sometimes medical terminology, statistics. So every school will have a list of uh, prerequisites that you must have. And then um, you need some sort of patient care experience, shadowing, uh, which is not always mandatory, but it's highly recommended because it, it helps you make sure that you understand the profession and how it's different to maybe um, other, other options um, so that you really know that this is what you want to do. Volunteering and then leadership opportunities are always very helpful. So 
if you are involved in, you know, undergrad and clubs and things like that, that is going to help build your your um, resume. Then you would apply to an accredited program. So most programs require a CASPA application that's a centralized system. And then you may need the GRE or the PA CAT, letters of recommendations, and a personal statement. So once you get MPA school, you complete a two to three years master's level program. There are also a few, a handful, I'm not sure exa exactly how many, but there's a handful of programs that have a, um, like a five-year track. So it combines both the, you know, the bachelor's and the master's level program, which is really nice. So you don't have to apply twice um, and it's a lot faster. And then you have a licensing exam, which is called the PIM, Physician Assistant National Credentialing Examination. And then after that, there's a few more things, but we won't get into that. It just depends on the state and where you're gonna work. So a little bit of, so how my route kind of looked, my, my journey looked. So I did my bachelor's in dietetics and nutrition. I worked for about three years as a dietitian in diabetes and pregnancy. Uh, my shadowing was urgent care, PAs, emergency medicine, and the triage for um, the OBGYN service. I volunteered with the American Diabetes Association and a couple uh, local nutrition education programs. And then um, I applied to two programs. My first cycle, I had one rejection, one interviewed, and was accepted to that program, which is the Detroit Mercy, University of Detroit Mercy. So for our program, we have a full-time two-year program, 24 months. And then there's also a three-year part-time program, which the first two years are uh, part-time because you're only taking classes. And then the third year, which is a clinical year, it would be considered full-time. Um, we also have that five-year track, but I know there's a couple other universities that do too. So basically you get out of high school and you start your undergrad, which is three years. And then the last two years are the PA program. Um, okay, so then I graduated in August and took my pants right away and started working right away. So this is just a quick message in case there are a few other um, who were kind of in my position because when I started applying to PA school or when I was in that process, I was um, 27 when I decided to go to PA school. Um, and so I would graduate by 30 or so if everything worked the way I had planned. Um, and part of me felt like, oh, am I too old, you know, to change, be changing careers right now? So is this going to be a smart move or not? And the truth is, it's, you're never too old. It's never too late to, you know, go after your goals and your dreams. Um, and it's okay for your goals to change as time goes by. And as long as you are flexible and willing to work for, for you know, for what you want, everything will fall into place and it will work out. So don't stop until you're proud and then just keep going. All right, so then in August, I started working in family medicine. Um, this was, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got this job, but um, why did I choose family medicine? So before I started PA school, before I did my rotations, um, I, it was really, I was really attracted to family medicine because it ha there's a huge opportunity for patient education and patient empowerment. And as a dietitian, I did a lot of education and I really, really enjoy that. I really like sitting down with my patients and helping them through their chronic conditions um, and just empowering them to take care of their own health. And in family medicine, that's what, that's part, a huge part of what you do. Um, the other thing too, is that we have a huge age, um, spectrum. So we have babies all the way to er the elderly. And so the patient, the continuity of care with the patient is something that I also really enjoy. I get to see my patients or, I mean, now I do, but also when I decided family medicine, that's kind of how I picture it. And I wasn't wrong. Um, you get to see your patients 
constantly or at least once a year if they are a healthy individual. But what's really beautiful, one of the PAs that I work with that has been at this clinic for about 30 years, he has taken care of entire families, like three, four generations. And, you know, we have patients that come, oh yeah, my grandma comes here. Or, you know, my grandma, my aunt, my, everybody comes here. And so that that continuity, that level of care, and it, it, the relationship you form with the patients is, is really nice. And, and, you know, it depends on what you're looking for, um, but I absolutely love it. Um, we also do minor procedures in the office which keeps it always interesting and fun. And then there's a lot of um, autonomy for PAs in family medicine, um, at least where I work. I have my own set of patients and you know each PA has their own patients, are actually our supervising physicians. They, um, they're not seeing patients right now because of COVID. They're both in their late 80s and you know with the pandemic, they kind of stepped down a little bit. Um, but they're always just a phone call away if we need them. And that I also really like. And then the hours are really good. I love my my job hours. I work Monday through Friday, about nine to five plus or minus 30 minutes in the morning or at night or in the afternoon. Um, and then I don't necessarily get, you know, scheduled lunch. Sometimes we work through lunch, sometimes we don't. Um, I don't have calls right now. We're not open during the weekends, but, um, but we usually are. There's just a change again because of the pandemic. Um, but other than that, I mean, if I had to work Saturdays, it would be maybe two Saturdays a month or so. So the hours are also very nice. Um, what I'd say in my work, like what a day in the life <laughs> works, um, it looks like, is I get... I get there around 8.45 or so, um, usually just ready to see patients, but sometimes I'll take one of the PAs and I, we split the uh, review in the lab work, or yeah, all the lab results that come back or um, to the clinic. So um, if there's some of that, we'll, we'll review that in the morning before we get ready to see patients. And then pretty much all day we're seeing patients. Um, our clinic is a little bit of a um, little bit old school, you could say. We have patient, we have charts. We don't have EMR, like we have paper charts. Um, we are also kind of like a walk-in clinic. So I don't have where you might see many PAs or, or offices will have like 15 minutes, you know, 20 or 30 minute appointment slots. We don't have any of that. It's just patients come in and we see as many patients as we can um and then like i said with the lunch break it just kind of depends i usually get very hungry right before noon so i sit down and, and have my lunch around noon but sometimes like yesterday i didn't have a lunch until about 1 30 or 2. Uh, it just depends on how busy it is um some days every day is different like yesterday was a very busy day uh, i probably saw uh, about 15 patients or so um, but the, just the office was re everything was hectic yesterday very busy um, today I saw maybe about eight patients or so which is about half and so depending on that then I might, might sit down and do more lab results taxes there's a lot of insurance paperwork that um, we have to do um, sometimes we have like a rep come in and we talk about new medicine and then we're back to seeing patients. The telemedicine I put here, this is only for COVID patients. So if we had somebody that recently um, tested positive or was um, discharged from the hospital, we would do telemedicine. Otherwise, we see everybody in person. And then right around five, we get ready to go home. So what types of appointments do I have? Um, a lot of my appointments are uh, there's a lot of hypertension and diabetes, so we have lots of follow-ups for blood pressure check after we um, have changed medications or the diabetes, you know, if their blood sugars are super high, we need to keep control. I might see them more often. Um, there's a lot of women's health also, and that includes pap smears or um, 
pelvic exams and breast exams, uh, follow-up appointments for blood results, uh, patient education and next steps uh, of maybe some studies that they've had done. So if we send them out for a mammogram and um, the results come back, you know, abnormal, they need more tests. So we'll talk about that. We have annual well visits and health maintenance, medication refills. There's a lot of sick visits or ER or hospital follow-ups as well. And these are only a handful of chief complaints that we might have, but we have a lot of patients coming in for pain, whether that's back, shoulder, knee pain, and headaches, very common, cough, which can be a ton of different things. Um, a lot of patients, they will come already saying that they think they have a UTI and they wanna get you know, checked for that or just a checkup, which <laughs> it could be a ton of different things. Also, they will just say, oh, I'm here for a checkup. And then you walk in and they have a list, like an actual list that they wrote down, all of their 10 complaints. Um, or it might be a rash, which comes with different kinds of rash. We see a lot of derm um, stuff here also, a lump, lump on the skin, which could be an abscess, a cyst, um, a rash also. And then med refills for a lot of different um, conditions. And these are sometimes my favorite appointments because at a med refill, we get to talk about, you know, their, again, their health. And we're always, you know, trying to look at what they're taking and do med reconciliation and make sure that their symptoms <clears throat> are being addressed or improving. So those are also nice visits. Gabby, I have a quick question for you. Um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Fowler and I rely very, very heavily um, on follow-up for patients. Oftentimes, patients come in for a specific emergency complaint, and um, the, the care that we provide is, is excellent, but we rely a lot on, on our patients to do that follow-up. How, how good is patients' compliance with, with these follow-ups? Do they make these follow-up appointments frequently or are we just kind of sending them out into the dark hoping they'll do the right thing? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, in my experience, I think that the ones that are more compliant with that follow-up are um, the ones that maybe have more chronic conditions. And if they were at the hospital for, you know, some some cardiac or maybe a pulmonary, um, sometimes for abscesses, we have a lot of patients that do come, you know, follow up for abscesses. Um, or if they were like hospitalized or had some sort of gallbladder issue, they, they're good at following up, but sometimes they don't follow up in the time frame. So you might want them to follow up, you know, within a week and we don't see them for like three or weeks or four for weeks and it's like hey, you're coming for something that happened about a month ago <laughs> you know um so i don't sense. know but i think I, we see a, a fair amount of those follow up from the er i think uh, you know for our, our young learners with us tonight no matter what specialty you're going into um when you're working with emergency medicine colleagues in the future we really rely on you for for the patients continuity is not just one yeah. visit kind of knock everything out it's a continuity thing so thank you for answering my question yeah and you know to add to that point um we also we send a lot of patients or not a lot of patients but there are a number of occasions where we have to send a patient to the ed um and so if we send the patient if, if you know if i said to them you have to go to the emergency room tonight um, they might keep you, they might not keep you. Um, I I make sure to follow up with them. So I'll call them like the next morning, um, see if they were admitted, or I might give them like two days and and then call them, see what happened or see if they're going to come back. Um, but that's, you know, trying to catch them before they go home and then they stay at home for another month or so. So Gabby, you said uh, <clears throat> you didn't want to have an electronic medical record. We don't, so right, we don't have, paper, is that we true? only have paper charts. So um, um, what do you think? I mean, we're all electronic now and I, yeah. <clears throat> thank goodness I can type pretty fast. Otherwise I might prefer a handwritten record myself. <laughs> um, I, 
I am so eager for our clinics to have the EMR and they have it. They just, the process of implementing it, it's very slow. Um, and then through the pandemic, they were very short staffed. They only had two PAs working. And one of them is a younger guy who is the one that's been, you know, trying to get the clinic up to speed with the EMR. And the other one is um, a little bit more old school and not very fond of change, we could say. So it, that, like that dynamic, that's what they kind of struggle with changing. But now that I'm there and I'm also, you know, like, let's get into the EMR because everything could be so much faster and easier um but you know it's change and it's a huge change so it just takes time and convincing a lot of convincing and an education and patience and you know from all the staff um but i i wish it was emr i just you know <laughs> i'm working on that our hospital has this bad habit of uh, having our EMR go down for maintenance about midnight, you know, we're 24 hours a day and uh -huh. for an hour and a half, we're back on paper, you know, and it's kind of a nuisance. Yeah. Yeah. My, I can tell you my hands hurt a lot and, you know, because the, the other thing with the, or what I think is the problem with paper charts is that the documentation can sometimes um, get pretty sloppy or, or like, you know, it's easier to not be as detailed versus when you have EMR and you have templates and you have, um, you know, or you can type faster than you would write. So because I knew that coming in, I was just in my mind, like, I'm going to you know, do my documentation as good as I can, regardless. And so I try to um, sit down and but my hand really hurts, you know, after a long All day right. of so, writing. <laughs> yeah, good. So Rohit, I think we got some questions, do we? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, starting off, um, one of the questions we had was, since you're an international student, uh, how did that affect your application process? I know that you talked a little bit about it before, but do you think that made it harder for you? Great question. Um, I didn't go to PA school as an international student, but I did do my undergrad as an international student. And that process was hard uh, just because of, you know, for them to validate the same classes that I had before um, in Venezuela and then here, I had to like up, get all of my records from the university in Venezuela, had them translate it and have them looked at here. Um, once that was in my, my record for undergrad, then it wasn't an issue for PA school. But when I went to apply to PA school, even though I wasn't an international student, I was very limited in which schools I decided to apply because some of them explicitly said that they wouldn't take courses, like say anatomy from um, a university outside of the state. And so like my anatomy was from anatomy and physiology, those classes I took in Venezuela and I didn't take them here again. So there were a lot of programs that already I, like I wouldn't qualify and I wasn't about to, you know, go and do all of that again. Um, so that's where you could say it was a little bit hard. It, and that's part of why I only applied to two schools in the end. But as far as applying as an international student, I wouldn't, I don't have a lot of information on that. So. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, so at, since you're now a family medicine PA, how much time do you spend uh, counseling your patients on their nutrition and exercise routines? And also, are they generally good at following through with that? Um, per visit, I try to talk to all of my patients about it, at least if it's, even if it's just two minutes that I say, you know, how are you eating? How are your bowel movements? What's your exercise? And this is standard for me. I ask this every, to everyone, regardless of, you know, regardless of their, their comorbidities, because everybody needs to follow a healthy diet. Um, so I talk to them at least for about, you know, five minutes, so I don't go into a whole lot of details. I have um, created, you could say, like a list of maybe like five recommendations that I give everyone. And I always say, if we have to make this really simple, um, you know, no juice, no pop, fruits and veggies, and at least five portions a day and try to avoid fast food um, and drink lots of water and at least 30 minutes of exercise. 
five days a week or so. And depending on where they're at, what their situation is, because I have a lot of patients that it's, uh, you know, they'll come and say, well, I can't walk up outside, number one, because of the weather, or two, I work two jobs, I have no time. And when I do, it's dark outside, and I live in a neighborhood that it's just not safe to go walk, you know, outside. So we might address their specific concerns and try to create a plan on how they can incorporate healthy eating or lifestyle. Um, and then if they do have, say, diabetes or hypertension, we might spend, especially with my patients with diabetes, um, we spend a lot more time and I don't necessarily create a meal plan, but I ask them a little bit more about what they eat so we can figure out what they need to change in a very easy and simple way. And I always tell them, let's just take them one step at a time. No need to make all five changes at once because then you get overwhelmed um, and then you don't follow through with any of them. But then that's also why we have follow-up appointments. So I'll see them, you know, every two weeks, every month, every three months, depending on how well controlled they are. And every time we talk a little bit about that and same goes for smoking. We address that. I try to address that every single visit and I tell them, you're going to get tired of me saying this, but, and then we get into it. Thank you for sharing those tips. Gabby, with us. Um, uh, G Gabby do you yeah. have a lot of diabetic patients who don't take very good care of themselves? I do. Unfortunately, do I do. We do in the ER also, we see so many diabetic patients who just don't look after themselves and they come in when they've got a dead foot or dead toes mm -hmm. and so forth. And we end up taking their legs off. Yep. Um, so yep. how do you approach the diabetic patient? How do you approach the diabetic patient who is assigned to you, but they're really just not doing a good job? How do you go after that? <clears throat> so what I like to do is talk a little bit about their living situation, their work, um, you know, what other maybe responsibilities they have so that I can understand why they're not caring for their diabetes. A lot of the times what happens is they have just so much on their plate that their sugars are the least of their concerns because you don't have a whole lot of symptoms until it's too late, like until you get, <clears throat> you know, foot gangrene and they have to take your food off. Um, but they might have a uh, frequent urination and they just keep thinking that it's a UTI I've actually had that several times like oh I've been to the you know uh, urgent care or whatever because it's UTIs but well no it's actually your sugar um so I like to sit down and, and understand what's going on and then a lot of times it comes out that they are afraid and they never check their sugars because they don't want to see how high it's going to be or they're afraid that they might need insulin because so and so died when you know, they um, started using insulin. And so depending on what they say, I try to um, give them the education and kind of reverse that and help them see why this is important and why that uh, preconceived notion may not be accurate. Um, and then we work on what is one change that you can do today? What is one thing that when you leave this office, you are 100% committed? And if they say, you know, I will, I will take my med medication. Okay, well, that's, that's all we're going to work on. And next time, maybe we work on getting rid of the pop and the juice. And, and with that, I, I tell them is there is no point in me giving you the best medicine, even if it's just the easiest to use and the very best medicine, if you don't change your lifestyle and your eating, it's not going to work. It's, or it's not going to work as well. So I do the medicine part. And you have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and a lot of the times they, you know, say like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to do something. Um, I've been successful, you could say, not always. But I've, with that, I think that it, it really helps encourage them and empower them. And we've been, I've been able to lower a lot of the A1C slowly, but we have... <laughs> Uh, Gabby, um, are you beginning to see many people uh, tracking their blood sugar on their smartphones? I see those ads for the Freestyle Libre and they can yeah. <clears throat> graph their sugars. Do you, do you follow those things or do you see those? 
Um, I used to when I was working in, in my, my previous job as a dietitian, uh, especially because I had a lot of patients with type 1 diabetes. I don't have that many with type 1 right now, but um, many of the type 1 patients I had, they would, you know, they had a, a, a pump or a sensor and we would, the graphs are amazing and help if you have the time to sit down and explain to the patient how that works and kind of what we're looking for, it works really, really good. Where I'm work, where I'm working right now, um, the the patient population is a little bit, you know, different and it's it's a underserved population and whether it's they don't have access to it, they actually have a lot of issues with even just getting a glucometer because the insurance won't cover it. Um, and but the ones that do, we just have them write it old style. Everything is old school here, <laughs> so I just have them write it down or bring their meter and then we'll look at it. But no, I don't have right now. I don't have a lot of patients with those graphs. Rohit, take it away. All right, let's just ask one more question and then we can move on. Yeah. So, how would you say your experiences and education in Venezuela have shaped your career as a physician assistant? Well, um, because I started, so what I like about our education in Venezuela is that you go straight into your um, major. So like here in, you know, in the U.S., you have your first couple of years or so with a lot of kind of like a core curriculum. Um, and you will have classes with like everybody, regardless of what the, back, the, the bachelor's would be. Um, in Venezuela, you go straight into, so like my, like I said, my first year was anatomy and um, at biochemistry at those kind of more intense classes, I guess. And, <clears throat> and, and just uh, getting or becoming more familiar with, with medicine right away um, is what helped me kind of fall in love with being a part of the healthcare team. Um, then when I when I transferred here, so I I wasn't too exposed to. I had a couple of um, hospital rotations, or not rotations, but like classes where I had to go to a hospital. Um, and then coming here, when I went to to undergrad here, um, it what helped me was that I had already learned a lot of things in Spanish, and I had to take a few classes again, but then I learned them in English, and so. Right now, as a PA, when I have to talk to my patients, see what happens is when you learn something in English, like there are things that I've learned. The first time I learned them, I learned them in English. So then trying to explain those in Spanish, sometimes like I have to think a little bit harder. Like I have to go, you know, the other way. Um, but having had part of my education in Spanish, like my, my anatomy and physiology and things like that, and then also in English, I think that has helped me now um, be able to, you know, use also medical terms and everything in both languages. So I think that's probably where I would say it helped me the most. All right. Thank you for sharing. Uh, why don't we move on to the next part of the presentation? All right. All right. So I have some case studies. Um, this is, oh, see, not result. That's, that's one of the ones they said it was my favorite. So this is a 58-year-old patient. These are all, um, you know, uh, HIPAA compliant. So kind of change a few things here, typical patient presentations. So 58-year-old female with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, anxiety, depression, arthritis, and she is also a smoker. And she says she's here just for a med refill. So we look at the chart and we see that she's also due for her annual well visit. So let's see what should we address today. So what I like to do first, because she said she was, or not first, but one of the things that I like to do is because she said she was here for a med refill, well, let's take a look at all of your medicine. So we see here she's taking her aspirin. Um, she has her simvastatin for her cholesterol. She has lisinopril for her high blood pressure. She has two medicine for her GERD or peptic ulcer disease. Um, then she has the Taliprim and Xanax for her anxiety and depression. And she has two medicines, two NSAIDs for um, her arthritis and pain. So we go over what I do with them is just 
go over each one of them. Are you taking them? When do you take them? Um, you know, if she has these two medicines here for GERD, well, do you need them? Do you? Sometimes they will say, oh, that, you know, uh, I don't know, the methadone doesn't really do anything anymore or um, no, I don't, I barely had any, any symptoms anymore. So then we try to discontinue or taper the dose out. Um, and then with the mental health and anxiety and depression, um, <clears throat> I like to spend some time also talking about that to most of the patients, especially through the pandemic. There is just so, so, so much um, mental health issues that we are seeing. And whether it's because now patients are, you know, just at home, they're not doing um, what they used to do or because um, they've lost their job or now they've actually had to pick up more jobs or whatever it is. There is so much um, mental health and sometimes patients think that, you know, a medicine will take all of their worries away or will make everything better. And I am a huge advocate for counseling. And it's something that I talk to all my patients about. I always say you don't really need to have a diagnosis to go talk to a therapist. Um, you know, it's good for, for us to talk about what our issues are and trying to find um, healthy coping mechanisms so that you don't need. I And this, the Salopram and the Xanax, I always explain to them, like, because unfortunately I have a lot of patients that are on controlled substances that take a lot of, um, whether it's pain medication or anxiety medicine like Xanax or Valium, um, I tell them, this is like your uh, rescue medicine and your maintenance medicine, like for someone that has asthma. Um, I want you to take some sort of medicine to help keep kind of the edge off of things that you take on a daily basis so that, that we can call your maintenance medicine so that you don't need that rescue Xanax every single day. That's not good. Um, eventually, you're going to end up needing, you know, 60 tablets a month instead of just 30. Um, so why don't we try to add therapy or a, if it's somebody that hasn't been started on any medicine, we talk about therapy first and other things they can do. Um, and sometimes, depending on where, where we get with that, we are able to taper or lower the doses out, which is also one of my favorite things um so they don't develop you know um dependence or or have other issues especially when they take also pain medicine along with something like Xanax or some other um control medication and then we would talk about their pain so where is her arthritis has she tried physical therapy yet um, what other things she's doing, um, you know, this patient has GERD or pe peptic ulcer disease maybe, and then she is taking two NSAIDs, so that is not a good thing, so we look at the uh, uh, interactions with the med medications and the risk of other um, complications as well, so this right there is something that I would try to get away, get her away from some of these medicines. Um, and then we would also talk about health maintenance. So we check, you know, her blood pressure and all the vitals. We check if she's due for any vaccines. When is she due for a pap smear for mammograms, which we start after age 40 or so, or depending on the patient. Um, colonoscopies that we start after about 50. Um, whether she's due for any routine labs and then all the things that um, we're kind of talking about. And then a plan for for quitting smoking, which also therapy could help because a lot of the time smoking is just either a habit or something that they do to help with their anxiety. So we have to find healthier coping mechanisms. Um, and then we make a plan, basically the patient, you know, I, I don't like to impose anything on the patient. I'm always asking them, you know, what, what do you think you can do? Do you think there's a problem? Do you have a plan? Um, because there's no point in me telling them like, oh, you need to quit smoking. Okay, I'm, you know, here's some um, Cantix, which is a medicine to help them with that. And then I like, no, they have to be the the leader. I always tell them we are a team and you are the team leader. So let's do this together. 
Um, okay, our second case, it's um, this would be say a new patient who is uninsured, and we have a lot of patients that are um, that are uninsured also, so they just pay cash. And so this is a 45 year old male with a chief complaint of frequent urination. So this patient says he has noticed frequent urination, increased thirst, and he is always hungry. He also complains of bilateral foot pain. Um, this has been going on for about a month or so. He works as a truck driver, um, states that he often eats fast food because he's a truck driver. Um, he doesn't really have a lot of time to work out or anything like that. And again, because he's a truck driver, he has to, or, or so he says, he has to drink a lot of coffee and Red Bull so that he can stay awake during long um, drives. He denies any irritation, pain, or burning with urination, no wrath, no fever, chills, headaches, cough, shortness of breath. Basically, everything is fine. Um, his past medical history, uh, obesity, high cholesterol, and kidney stones back in 2010. And his family history is positive for diabetes and heart disease and colon cancer. So uh, for his vitals, we uh, have his blood pressure is 138 over 88. Um, his physical exam is pretty good, except um, he has his newer exam, his great toe. I think I put a picture. Okay. He has decreased vibratory signs and his monofilament, which I'm going to show you what that is. Um, he only fills out above the metatarsal. So this, with the tuning fork, that is the uh, vibratory sense. That is usually one of the first, well, I will tell you more about that in just a second. Um, and, and then this is um, the monofilament. These two are sensing or are testing for sensory, um, the sensory aspects. And you're going to see why I did that. So we get a urine zip and he has four plus glucose in the urine. And then his glucometer was 358. So these two tests here are for diabetes. Um, for patients, do, when patients have uncontrolled diabetes and when they are first diagnosed with type two, usually they have had high blood sugars for a long time and they just don't know it. Um, there is a lot of undiagnosed diabetes and pre-diabetes. And as the years go by, and as the sugars are high, 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 they just kind of, you know, accumulate everywhere in your vessels, in the eyes, in the kidneys, in the nerves. And so um, that decreases sensation. And these are two tests that we can do in the office that are very simple to kind of confirm um, the, that decreased sensation. And then that plus the glucose in the urine and, and the very high sugar in the office, we can confirm that you know this is diabetes um, and that he has probably been walking around with diabetes for a long time. So again, because this is an uninsured patient and he's going to pay cash um, for our, all, of his, all of his tests, I try not to do too many testing. Um, I do always offer them like this is this is all what I you know what we would do but they always ask how much is that going to be and so typically we end up if, if I have to choose if I'm limited because of you know the cost that that would represent to the patient these are the three things that I would do which is the A1C to help me see um, kind of get a little bit of an average of where the sugars have been for the past three to four months um, get their lipids and see where they're at, especially this patient had a history of high cholesterol, and then the creatinine to assess their kidney function. Um, so this is just a little um, table here to, to help you see how we diagnose diabetes. So there are a ton of different ways to diagnose diabetes uh, in terms of which testing we would use. So the first one, that we see here is a fasting blood sugar. So that means when they haven't had anything to eat for about eight hours or so, uh, you can do a blood sugar test in the office. And if that's over 125, that is diagnostic for diabetes. And between 100 and 125, then that's pre-diabetes. Uh, we can also do a two hour glucose test. 
which we don't use very often because they have to it's two hours that's a very that's a very long time a lot of people don't have that time and they have to go to the lab you know get drink this um, concentrated sugar thing and then be there and, and get their sugar test so we don't really use that but in pregnancy we do use it a whole lot that's actually the, the standard of care for pregnancy um, but we can also use the a1c which is this test that tells us the blood sugars for the past three to four months and it's kind of an average so we're looking for anything over 6.5 so we can call that diabetes um, between 5.6 and 6.4, that is pre-diabetes. And then the other one, which is what our patient uh, qualifies or what applies to our patient is classic symptoms of hyperglycemia. So that means the increased thirst and urination, the freaking urination. Um, so polydipsia, polyphagia, um, those are typical symptoms of high blood sugar, plus a random blood sugar test of over 200. Um, if this patient hadn't had any symptoms and we just did a random sugar that was maybe 250 in the office, uh, we would need to have another kind of test to confirm. So we would need at least two. Um, but because he has all of the symptoms, we are telling him today that he has type 2 diabetes. So how do we treat him? The first line is always, always going to be lifestyle modification. So like we were talking just a little bit ago, we talk about the eating. Um, I tell them like this, what you eat and what you drink are the most important things for your diabetes. Um, then we have to add a little bit of exercise because that will help. It's, it's a, one of the best ways for your body to use the extra sugars. So if you can do even if it's 10 minutes, maybe after you eat, so that, that you know, calories and that, that carbohydrates and sugars that you're taking in, um, you put them to use. Just go for a walk. Don't sit down after you eat. Just go for a little walk. Um, but what they, oh, going back to what they eat and what they drink, no concentrated sugars. And the two main ones are juice and pop. Nobody needs to drink juice or pop. You don't just drink lots of water. You can do tea. Um, if you make it at home, you know, if you boil some water and put some like lemon and ginger and something like that, um, but nothing else. Even, even, um, cause they will say, well, can I do like crystal light or ice sparkling water? Yes, those are fine if they are calorie free, but your whole fluid intake shouldn't be that. You should should be drinking water for most of the day. And then if you want to switch it up, that's fine. Um, and then other sugary foods, you know, Pop-Tarts. Um, I don't know why, but a lot of people eat those for breakfast. Not a good thing. And then cereal. So that goes with like the three meals and the two to three snacks and, and what they eat. I just briefly tell them like what to avoid. And then I give them a couple ideas on what they could have, because it also doesn't work if you just tell a patient, well, you can't, you know, you can't eat cereal, you can't eat McDonald's, you can't drink pop juice. Okay, so then they're going to look at you like, well, what do we do? <laughs> so you have to give them options too. And so I will tell them, you know, cereal, this is the reason why cereal is a very bad food. It's a lot of sugar, a lot of carbohydrates. Milk does have a little bit of protein, but um, when you add the cereal, the amount of carbohydrate you get in that meal is it's ridiculous. It's about 50, 60, 70 grams of carbohydrates, and that's about two big meals. Um, and there's not a lot of protein. So when you have just sugars uh, or just carbohydrates in your meal, your sugars spike. When you have some protein with that, it doesn't it goes up, but it doesn't spike. Um, so I explained it that way. And then with that comes metformin. But see, I spent a lot of time talking about the things that they can do and how they can change their day-to-day -day activities. And then we add the medicine. So metformin is uh, a great medicine. It works. It has about three different ways that it works. Um, but one of it is that it helps our muscles kind of and our cells take up more of the respond better to the insulin so that we can take the sugar. Um, and 
or we can use the sugar for for energy and you know for our all of our functions so metformin is very very good because it doesn't have a side effect that many other diabetes medicines have which is low blood sugar so we start at a lower dose which is 500 and i you know they have to start it before meals twice a day and then depending on what their a1c came back um then we may increase their their dose and at the same time i have them start testing their blood sugars at least once a day uh fasting that's it if they forgot the fasting a bedtime would also be good um but just once a day so that we can kind of see where their sugars are at because right now all we have for this patient is a random sugar in the office um which it could be because he ate mcdonald's and pop you know uh two hours ago but still it shouldn't be that high um so maybe his fastings are better and maybe as he starts to make these changes, the sugars will come down and maybe he doesn't need a, a, a dose increase. So we have him come back and, um, yeah, I didn't put that there, but we would have him come back in a couple of weeks and see how he did. And a patient I recently have like this, recently had um, with this situation, he actually came a month later and he, he had been testing his blood sugars. They had gone down, like you could see the fasting the first uh, week or so, he was probably in the 250 or so. And by week four, um, his fasting blood sugars were about 150, which is very good. I mean, when you start, uh, you know, 400 or so, what was the sugar here? Um, 358. Um, that's a great change. And so at that point, I said, we're just going to, his A1C was a little high. It was about nine or 10. Um, but he was so engaged in the treatment and he took it so seriously. He was doing, uh, as, you know, as best as he could. It wasn't the exact same like truck driver, but he was doing as best as he could. Um, and I just said, let's just have you keep working on this, keep doing this. And then in three months, we check your A1C again and we go from there. Um, so I think a lot of the times it just depends on how, you explain it to them and how you present and why it's important. And if they see the value on it and they're, then they will be ready to take change, uh, take action and make change happen. Um, it, it's more likely that they will do that. I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's interesting, uh, Gabby, about what metformin does. Cause you yeah. obviously use metformin in people who have some insulin around the type twos and metformin makes their body more sensitive to what insulin they have. It, it improves the receptors. Uh, to, it makes the receptors more sensitive to the insulin that they have. Uh, it's a great drug. It's a great drug for that. <clears throat> yes. Yes. It's very good. Um, sometimes a lot, some patients will say, well, it, it gives them, you know, a little bit of diarrhea. So they stop taking it. And when we do the patient education, I try to tell them that the first few days, take it with the, with the food. So like sandwich it in, you know, take a few bites and take your metformin and they keep eating. Um, Cause that tends to uh, decrease the chances of having um, diarrhea or like loose stools. And <clears throat> after that, or if it did give them those discomforts, then it usually goes away after a few, you know, a few days or so. It, it won't, but sometimes they just don't give it enough time. Um, but yes, it's a, it's a great medicine and we would use it for type two diabetes. Um, type one would be totally um, yeah, different. Hey, yeah, hey Gabby, in the background in chat, there's been a lot of conversation about the cost of insulin, hundreds of dollars per month for yeah. a drug that 25, 30 years ago used to be $20 a month. Do you ever have patients complain about the cost of their medicine or in fact can't get their medicine because they can't afford it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Very unfortunate, it's very sad. Um, it just depends on insurance and the coverage you know, that they would have, but for some of these patients that are uninsured or simply the insurance they have doesn't cover the insulin, um, there are patient assistance programs from some of the manufacturers and 
um, you just need to fill out an application. And some of these programs are amazing. They will give the patient free insulin uh, for up to a year. And it depends, you know, they have to fill out some forms. Um, it's like based in, in, income based and things like that. But when they do qualify, which most, most patients would, it's great. Um, as far as, you know, helping the patient still get the insulin. But yes, the price of the insulin is, it's insane. Um, Walmart does have a lower cost insulin. So some of these patients that don't have any kind of insurance or are undocumented, I also do have a lot of patients that are undocumented. So, you know, they, they can apply for some of these programs. Um, they can get a, a more affordable insulin at Walmart. Um, which I think uh, it's called Novolin. And I think a vial is maybe like $30 or so. Um, so that's, I, I try oh. to help them out as much as I can. But yeah, yes, no, no kidding. That, that's cheap compared to $300 or, or yeah, more. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the time it's just a, an insurance game. So I'll call the pharmacy and we can spend a few minutes on the phone, you know, saying like, okay, try this one now. Um, they don't cover vials and you know they don't cover the pens but maybe they'll cover vials and syringes they don't cover um lenses maybe they will cover vascular or something like that so we just like literally the pharmacist i can just picture the pharmacist typing in you know a different <laughs> medicine to see which one is covered um or like some just trying to find the best way to for the patient to to have um the insulin but it's very difficult sometimes All right, um, so our next case, another patient with diabetes. So this is a 60 year old uh, male with diabetes, hypertension and high cholesterol. And he's here today to check um, her, his privates for a rash. So he says he's had a itchy rash on his penis for about a week, but he was waiting until his met refill appointment to have it checked. Um, he has seen mild amount of white thick discharge and some red spots in the glands. Um, and the foreskin. There's no fever, chills, no urinary symptoms, no pelvic, abdominal, flank pain. He's not sexually active because um, since his wife passed away. Um, so what are we thinking? I'm not looking at the chat, but if you know, feel free to still put stuff in there. Um, so next we would drape the patient for a genital exam. So we have to take a look. Anytime there's a rash, you have to look at it. Um, and so we have him drape and we see that he has some redness. There's a little bit of a, a rash. It's um, like this thick and the lumpy discharge. So we think about what this patient could have. And when, you, when you're when you putting that um, differential diagnosis together, you want to keep in mind also the history of the patient. Um, but this could be a candida, which is a yeast infection. It could be a dermatitis. Um, dermatophytosis, which is also kind of like a yeast and fungal infection, or a viral. Um, so we ask, we might ask a few more questions and check his blood sugar. You know, we find out again that his blood sugar is uncontrolled. His A1C, most recent A1C was in the eight and nine uh, percent range. So for this patient, based on his history and based on how the rash looks, we come to diagnosis that he has candida, uh, balanitis, and we go over the treatment with him, which includes good hygiene, keeping the area clean, um, moisture free. We give him an antifungal to take, um, and he has to come back in about 10 days or so, or sooner if there is no improvement. And because the, the most likely cause for this is his uncontrolled sugars. We have to spend some time again talking about that. Um, it, for this case, it's a male, so he would get balanitis, but in females, um, I have a lot of patients who have been coming for, for yeast infection or what they think is a yeast infection. And so same thing, we would do a pelvic exam. And sometimes it's as simple as just looking and, and a clinical diagnosis. Sometimes we might take uh, sample and send it out to the lab to confirm. But if, if that's the case and 
also just just trying to build a um, um, combination of things here, but also patients that come with abscesses, um, diabetes and high blood sugars, uncontrolled diabetes is one of the reasons or one of the cause, most likely cause for this type of, of infection. So when you have a patient with recurrent yeast infections or recurrent abscesses, you want to check um, their sugars and ask them, have they ever been told, you know, they have high blood sugars or someone in the family and check their sugars, check their urine because very likely that they will also have that. Um, I recently had a patient that had a very large um, labial abscess and she was actually seen at the ER, they drain it and then she came back for her follow-up, which is uh, what we were talking about. And I said to her, do you have, do you have high blood sugar? She said, no. Have you ever been told you had high blood sugar? No. So I dig a little deeper in her chart and I see that at some point she was taking metformin. And I said, hmm, well, you were taking metformin at some point. Oh, yeah, yeah, a long time ago, I guess I did. Okay, well, let's, let's check your sugar. No. No, I don't want. I don't want to check my sugar. Hmm. Well, you know, if this absence happens to be because of your sugar, and we don't treat your sugar, this is gonna happen again. And I, I think as soon as I said that, she's like, oh, "Okay, check my sugar," because that was painful. It was a bad absence, and she obviously doesn't want that happening again. So we check her sugar, and it was about three hundred and something. <laughs> so you know, there it goes, the, the sugar talk again and trying to get her um, controlled. I haven't, I haven't seen her again, so she was not a good follow-up. Um, but who knows, maybe she will come back for you another know, answer. Uh, you know, Gabby, there are many, many patients simply don't want to know. They just don't want to know. Exactly. Because as long as they don't know, they don't have to face it until something terrible happens, like their toes fall off. Right. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss, right? They say. Uh, <laughs> so. Gil and I, Dr. Salazar and I in the emergency room, we have people who, refu people who refuse to have their blood alcohols drawn because they don't want us to know and they don't really want to know how drunk they really are. Yeah. Oh. You don't yeah. see drunk people in your office, do you? No, no. We have <laughs> patients <have vacation, laughs> with alcohol problem, but I haven't seen them drunk in the office just yet. <laughs> Gil, you don't see drunk people in your ER, do you? No, 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 never. <laughs> maybe, like, maybe like four times per shift. Sometimes. But yeah. you know what? Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, part of the uh, the beauty in, in medicine is that even in, in these individuals, you find a little bit of grace um, in all of them. And, and you go back to the fact they're, they're human beings. So even in that status, even when they're completely uh, unaware of the consequences of, of their behavior, you know, you find a little mm -hmm. bit of grace um, in them sometimes. Yeah. Let's take yeah. that point for a minute, Gil and Gabby, because that's exactly right. And for all of you listening, the 500 and almost 50 of you that are still with us, you know, we must never, never be judgmental. What we must do is examine, we draw conclusions, we present the facts, but we must not judge because mm -hmm that's between them and their own higher power and uh what we have our job is to hopefully kind of love them a little bit into making the right decisions but that's our job you know ray one of the uh, it really hit home kind of changed my outlook on on this specific on giving these patients grace sometimes what about when it's a colleague a fellow physician who is brought in by police intoxicated and you are asked to be their physician, you know, like that's when it really changed for me. Um, when it was just kind of, there are strangers usually that we see when it's actually somebody that you know, a, a colleague, a fellow physician in that situation, man, it really, really hits home. It did for me that day for sure. Yeah. No. Gabby, this I is hope not to be in to those shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. All right, let's see. Um, so, okay. so the next one is a uh, pain uh, complaint. So for pain assessment, you, there's different ways to assess. Um, you can use this mnemonic, OPTRST, so to help you in remembering kind of what to ask and, and what things to address. But oh, for onset, so when did the pain start? 
uh, provocative or palliative factors. So what makes it better? What makes it worse? The quality of the pain. So is it sharp? Is it um, tingling? Is it um, stabbing? The radiation, does it go anywhere else, the pain? Does it just stay there? Severity, which you can do in a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst. Um, and the time, so is it intermittent? Does it come and go? Um, or is it constant? It's always there. So our next patient is another 67 year old um, male patient with a past medical history of arthritis of the right knee. But today he's here for abdominal pain. So he says he um, has had this intermittent abdominal pain for about a month. The pain is diffuse, um, sometimes epigastric, and it feels like burning. It's like a little bit of a burning sensation. Um, he says it often happens when he gets upset, usually after eating certain foods. Um, it goes away on its own, and it, he doesn't usually take any medicine. But in the past um, one to two weeks, the pain has increased in frequency, um, peak intensity last night, and he took some tramadol, which is a controlled pain medicine um, that he was previously prescribed for his arthritis of the knee. But because he was having this really bad abdominal pain, he decided to take um, some tramadol. So what else do we need to ask this patient? Mm. Maybe I'm gonna take a look at the at the um, chat for just a second. Well, I know what I want to know. I want to know if yeah. he gets the pain when he walks up a flight of stairs or not. I also want to know his past medical history of his family, cardiac disease, and so forth. That's one of the principal things on my list. Uh huh. So we ask a few more questions. These are um, well, the two of you. So. He doesn't have any cardiac history, um, no history, no cardiac history on, on him or the family. Um, and he doesn't take any other medicine. He's never taken any other medicine. Um, no, the pain doesn't happen when he's, if he's walking. He's just, right now he was saying that he, it's just constant. Now it's there. So um, a little bit more in the history, we asked about what his diet is like. He eats a lot of Mexican food, fried foods. He doesn't drink a lot of water. Um, he doesn't have any nausea or vomiting. His bowel movements have been regular. No diarrhea, constipation, no blood. But last week he did have green stools. Um, he's been voiding regularly, but he says the urine was a little bit dark, um, kind of red this morning. Otherwise, no urinary complaints. He's a non-smoker, no recent travel, no regular medicine. Um, these are his vitals. He's a febrile. His blood pressure is great. Um, vitals really look good. In the physical exam, he is um, pleasant, not guarding. He's very relaxed. And on his abdomen exam, there's a few standards to palpation. His positive bowel sounds. Um, no Murphy sign, which is a, uh, a test that we do for cholecystitis. Um, oh, I wish I had included a picture of how we do that. And no rebound tenderness, his pulses, um, all good. So I am thinking this, this, by the way, this was about, um, I think this happened about a month or so when I started. So I was a very brand, you know, very, very fresh. I'm still very fresh. I'm still very new. Um, but this was one of my, you know, big cases that I had. So I am thinking, first of all, I have to make, even though he doesn't have a known history of, of cardiovascular disease, I am still wanting to make sure that he's not having an MI. Um, but I'm also thinking that he probably has some biliary tract disease. He, it could be kidney stones. Could it be peptic ulcer, ulcer disease? And this is kind of based on some of the symptoms he has said, right? Um, like the, 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 um, the green stools and the type of pain with the certain foods. So what diagnostics I had in the office that I could do um, before deciding where to send this patient to uh, is an EKG to help me rule out this MI and troponins. I put question mark in the troponins because we do have a lab, but we don't have like troponins that is not something that I can do. I, I could do it, but they would have to come from the hospital, pick it up, and I wouldn't have the results until the next day. Um, 
but I can do an EKG, I can do a stat CBC to look for any other um, signs of infection. We're gonna check his urine and then draw a little bit more blood. Um, and do we need to do an ultrasound? Yes. Do I have that in the office right now? No. Um, so there are some limitations because again, this, this you know family clinic is not sometimes a little bit of an urgent care, but we don't have all the things that you might maybe have at the hospital. So his EKG came back beautiful. There is no evidence of ischemia. Everything looked good on the EKG. His CBC was normal. His white count was um, still pretty good. It was good uh, under uh, 14 or under 10. Um, his urine looked red. It was very red. There was three plus of bil bilirubin. So first thing before I'm covering this, you can't see me covering this on, on the screen. But when you see this red color in the urine, um, Honestly, the first thing I thought was, oh, this is, you know, this could be blood. Uh, but then that's why you have the urine dip. And then you see bilirubin that it can also cause a, a red color or red stain in the urine. Um, he had a little bit of nitrates and, and leukocytes. So he could also be having some urinary tract infection. And then it well, it's possible. It, yeah, Gabby, ahead. it's possible. But on the other hand, when there's pigment in the urine, especially peridium, which turns it orange, that makes the nitrites and leukocyte esterate test, uh, and for that matter, the bilirubin test, you, you can't trust it. So with this red urine here, it makes me wonder if the nitrite, nitrate, it actually it's nitrites, and leukocyte esterase are actually really positive or not. I didn't mean to interrupt, please go no, ahead. No, you're fine. But that is, that is, that's a great point because, um, some, one of the MAs was like the first thing she told me was like, well, we can't, she didn't, they didn't know that this was a male patient. Um, not that it matters, but um, she said, well, we can test it because it's red. They probably took some pyridio. Or and I said, no, he hasn't taken any medicine. He just took the tramadol and this is a male patient. So, you know, so he hadn't taken anything like that. Um, but that, that was the thing. Cause or it's the bilirubin. Mm -hmm. Or is the belly Um So then or is with the that, room, which means, which means what? Yeah, go ahead, please. Please go oh, ahead. Oh no, no, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I, Gil and I, <laughs> we we look at the old fashioned ways that people come in with elevated belly as in they as in that they are drinking themselves to, to death. But I suspect this is not your story on this guy. He's got epigastric pain, food related. Go ahead with your story. Let's, let's hear it. Yes, yep. Um, so he, um, so, so these other tests I wouldn't have available until um, more than 24 hours later. Um, and I, at that point, I, this was on a, mm, it was a weekday, but it was late. It was about five in the evening. And based on, on what I had, I didn't like the presentation and I thought that he needed an ultrasound right away. So I advised him to go to the emergency room um, for biliary tract disease because this could be a very early, um, uh, uh, very early gallstone, uh, stone, uh, yeah, gallstone um, getting stuck. And it, or, or, know, or, 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 common, or common bile duct stone for that matter. Or mm -hmm. common bile duct stone for that matter. Yeah, and so also or something this worse. Could be very bad. So because I didn't have or something all of worse. the exactly because I didn't have any other um, things or diagnostic tests that I could use right away in the in the um, office. I decided to send him to EG. So this is a little bit of a, an anatomy review. Um, so please add. Feel free to add if I missed something, but. Um, Let's see. I mean, this. Oh, okay. I thought I had one more, one more um, slide. So when I was yeah, talking we'll, about we'll the keep it there for a minute. Yeah. When I was talking about the Murphy sign, this is a test where you are are testing to see if there's stones that are irritated, and so you have you you press on the um, the the red cage on the right side, and have the patient take a deep breath in, um, and if if they stop breathing kind of abruptly when uh you know when they inhale 
um, because of pain, that is an indication that they might have um, a gallstone that's irritating their their um, their uh, gallbladder. But he didn't have that. He didn't have any fever, um, and his symptoms were a little bit vague. Um, so in terms of the anatomy, so first you have the gallstone, just simply gallstones that are sitting around. Um, they're called cholelysiasis, and a lot of people have them. Um, sometimes they can get a colicky pain from it, and you know they don't need to have surgery or anything like that. Um, now, if that gets stu stu uh, stuck here in the cystic duct, kind of getting out of the gallbladder, and it gets infected, then we call it cholecystitis. Um, and now if that stone keeps making its way out, now it, get, it can get stuck here, which is a common bile duct. And this is cholecystitis. Um, you know, here they, they, because it's obstructing the, the way out basically from the liver and the gallbladder, now they can have jaundice. So their the liver movement starts to accumulate and go up in the blood. So it gives them that yellowing. Um, in the skin or in the eyes. Um, and then if it continues to kind of go down and it gets stuck right here just before it enters the duodenum and the is small intestine, then that's when we call it cholangitis. And this is, it can be a, a way bigger um, uh, diagnosis and then a very, um, a, a huge problem for their health because this can cause a huge infection. Um, and this is ultimately what I was afraid that the patient eventually could have because he took that tramadol that kind of blunted that pain. And this is why control medications are, you know, a problem too, because patients take this medicine for something that it wasn't prescribed. Um, and so he kind of ignored it when, when it had happened. So this patient ended up having, uh, when he went to the hospital, he, he didn't go to the hospital that day. He went to the hospital the next day and he did have, uh, he had a, an ERCP, which is a procedure where they kind of go up the uh, common bile duct and they can diagnose as a diagnostic and therapeutic procedure, meaning that they can also, if they found a stone, they can remove it. Um, and he had that, but the stone was so big, they couldn't remove it. So then they try to do, um, well, then, oh, then his Billy Rubin had started. This is just what I was, you know, afterwards. I ended up patient followed up on everything, but um, he, his Billy Rubin started to go up in the blood and he started to get, his white count also was going up, up, up by the time he made it to the ED. And so eventually he needed a lab coli so to remove the stones, they had to wait until the inflammation kind of went down and the infection went down. So he ended up being at the hospital for like two weeks or something like that. Um, and when they did the lab coli, the stones were so big that they couldn't take it out. And so he ended up having a full abdominal surgery to remove all, you know, the stone, the gallbladder, everything. Um, so he was told that it was a good thing at the, when he made it to the hospital that it was a very good thing that you came to the hospital today because you could have died with, you know, this could have been pretty Gabby, much, much, much worse. Uh, Gabby, the stone sitting, I'm sorry, I was answering a question in chat. Where was it? Where was the stone? With the bilirubin elevated, was it in the common bile duct? From my understanding is that from what I was reading on the notes, um, I think his stone was, yeah, in the common bile duct, but making it really close to um, that exit. Yeah. Well, you, uh, Gabby, let me go on record. You saved his life. If you'd not sent him to the hospital, he'd have died. Because, you know, a stone jammed in the common bile duct with the bilirubin already elevated, backed up to the liver. It was a matter of time until the bowel got infected. So you saved that man's life. So yeah. Good for you. Yeah, that's how, that's what he was told. He said, um, you know, the provider that saw him at the ED said, boy, you are very lucky and you should be very grateful to that provider that sent you to the ED because this could have been a really bad outcome. And I was just, you know, I just following my instincts. I said, this doesn't look good. I may not know all the things. I may be very, very new at this, but I know enough to send this patient out because something is just not right. 
you know, you might not have seen that um, bilirubin. You might have looked at the nitrites and the urine and the leukocyte esterase and said, you know, I'll give you some antibiotics and send you home. And who knows what mm. would have happened? I mean, uh, he could have died of sepsis right. during the night. Good for you, Gabby. Good case. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is one. And oh, and then after he had all this surgery, um, he, the staples came, I guess he was coughing or something and the staples came off and his entire, like the incision open. And then he had more complications from the incision. I was like, oh my goodness, poor patient. Um, but he had the best attitude all throughout. You know, he was just like, right now I'm just going to take care of me. And he's a very active patient. He um, likes to play sports and tennis and things. And one of his worries at the beginning was like, when was he able going to be, when was he going to be able to go back to you know, the tennis court and play? And I was like, no, not just, not just yet. We're going to have you take good care of yourself and you know all the family issues that were keeping you up and stress none of that you have to relax it's like that's true I've been 60 some years of my life you know um worrying about everybody this is my time to to take care of myself and he is just a wonderful patient a wonderful story I will always remember this patient well Gabby also in the in, in the middle of a busy office day you took the time to listen to the guy and, and do a risk assessment. Yeah. So, so bully for you, that's great, good stuff. Thank you. And then I think this is the last one. So this is a 24 year old female with a history of asthma and she is here for vaginal discharge. So she says that um, she's uh, complaining of vaginal itching and discharge for about two weeks. There's no rash. Um, she has a history of unprotected intercourse with two different male partners. Um, she's denying any fever, chills, again, pelvic, abdominal, flank pains, just to discharge. So um, what things might you be thinking that we should do? Um, next, again, we prep for a pelvic and a pap smear and cultures and on exam. There are no external lesions. We find her cervix is a little bit red. Um, there's some off-white discharge. It's kind of thick and lumpy, kind of cottage cheese um, consistency. And then we come up with a differential diagnosis. So with a discharge on, on a female for like a cervical discharge, this is very tricky because when you learn by the book, you know, you might learn this, um, keywords and like cottage cheese, thick consistency, or like uh, fishy and off-white and whatever. And sometimes that is 100% true and you will see it and you will be like, this is exactly, you know, book-like. But sometimes it's not, a lot of the time actually it's not. And um, I have found that even when it looks one way, then you send it out for cultures and it, the results come back and it's none of those or it's something you know different um so and sometimes too what i've seen happening is that women confuse their own like their own normal discharge with something that they think is abnormal and they come repeatedly like every month to the office for what they think is maybe a yeast infection and we check it we check it and it's or or you know a bv or something and and it's not. And so trying to educate also the patient on what's normal and what's not is very important too. Um, but for her, uh, based on her history, I'm thinking, well, she could have an STD. This could be yeast infection. It could be bacterial vaginosis. So that is why we send it out. Uh, but based on how it looks and that thick and cottage cheese consistency, it's probably a yeast infection. So the final diagnosis, um, we would need to see the results that we're sending. But based on what we see in the office today, um, I decided to treat this patient with fluconazole, which is a, um, an antifungal, and give her prophylactic azithromycin because in the history, she had a, uh, intercourse, unprotected intercourse with two different partners. Um, you know, they usually disclose that they are concerned for STDs and things like that. So you can treat with azithromycin to uh, treat for chlamydia and then the rest whether we would treat sometimes 
provider street for chlamydia and gonorrhea together, but for that, I like to wait for the results unless they are absolutely sure that, you know, they were exposed to that. Um, and then patient education, a lot of patient education, always. So these are just some, those were some quick, I guess the, the uh, cholangitis patient was a little bit longer, but that is it. I hope that this was interesting and fun and that you guys learned something. And I am here for questions. Gabby, you used a term called differential diagnosis, which is so important because occasionally we see a person who has one thing going on, they've cut their finger or, you know, that's one thing, but so often like the guy with a bellyache that you described or the gal with the vaginitis, it could be so many things. And so you, you prioritize ultimately that I think it's this, it could be this, I don't think it's this. And I know it's not this. And this is what a real specialist in a field will do. I hope you can see, Gabby, the number of thank yous that are pouring into the chat right now. Everybody say thank you to Gabby. Let's get her, let's get her 400 thank yous real quickly. And yeah, then uh, thank you. <laughs> look, 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 look at them pouring in. Isn't that That's wonderful? awesome. Uh, Rohit, you want, Rohit, you want to take a question or two? Yeah, a few more questions. Um, one of the questions we received was, have you ever had patients who prefer only to see an MD or DO compared to a physician assistant? That's a great question. Um, I have not. What happens in our clinic is, um, so our clinic is, off, is owned by two physicians and most patients in terms of insurance, they get assigned to them and then they come in, you know, and then they'll ask, I'll go in and introduce myself and like, hi, my name is Gabby. I'm a PA, I will be seeing you today. And they're like, oh, I'm not seeing, they look at the, at the card. I'm not seeing Jerome. I'm like, no, he is our physician. Um, and so I explain a little bit, you know, they are the owners of the clinic. They're not seeing patients right now. Us three is, providers that work here are PA. So you won't see any one of us. And then there, that's usually about it. Um, what I do have is because I'm a newer provider there, a lot of the patients have been seeing one of the other two. And so they'll just ask, like, but they call, they call everybody doctors. They say, Dr. John or Dr. Aaron or Dr. Gabby. And so um, they'll say, can I see Dr. John? I'm like, well, we're all PAs, but if you mean you, can, you want to see John, you, you know, so that's about how it goes. Okay, that's good to know. Um, yeah. Another question we received is, how do you counsel patients on healthy eating? if they live in food deserts and don't really have access to nutritious foods? That's, that's a great question. Um, I try, I used to have, I don't have this right now, but I used to have a list of um, foods that they, affordable foods that they could get at like the dollar store or something like that. Um, but trying to stick with like fresh, uh, like in season fruits that are in season and a lot of, beans and legumes those are way way cheaper than you know meat for example and they are a huge source still of vitamins and minerals and proteins and healthy carbohydrates fiber so a lot of the times what happens is their preferences and how easy it might be to you know go to 7-eleven and get a cheeseburger or whatever uh, versus go to the store and prep the food. So we talk about what's important to them. And again, a small change that they can make. And so like today, actually, I had a patient, um, she wants to try to work on her diabetes or she wants to get a tummy talk and whatever. And I said, let's, let's get you to um, kind of set your mind for success. And if you do have that surgery, you want to be able to maintain those results afterwards so you have to find something that is a motivation for them right so like for her it's this surgery that she wants to have and keeping up those results well what can you do now um to to set you up for success and one thing is like the pop and juice and then the other one is you know breakfast lunch and dinner her all of her meals are a mess so i said maybe this week we only work on breakfast don't worry about your other meals like instead of having cereal you have couple of eggs and some fruit and a toast um and then once breakfast is a good meal for a consistent amount of time then we move on to lunch and then we move on 
to um, you know dinner and just little bits of changes. And if they say, I don't like veggies, I'm like, well, if you only like lettuce and tomatoes, that's fine. Just eat lettuce and tomatoes. And every week you add one new veggie, just give it a try and, you know, cook it in a few different ways, go online and try to find a few different re recipes. Um, and just like that, small changes, I think is what works best because if not, they get overwhelmed, they don't have time, they come up with all the excuses and you have to help them nav navigate through that. Thanks for sharing that advice. That I it's interesting that a cheeseburger is less expensive than a head of broccoli. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it can be. It's crazy. I don't understand it. Uh, Rohit, maybe one more. All right. Uh, last question for tonight, then. Um, as a family medicine practitioner, do you feel like you're getting a lot of variety with your cases? Or do you feel like sometimes that you're kind of getting into a routine, like you kind of know what the patients are coming for and you come? can already expect what's going to happen. That's a great question. Every day is different. Every single day is different. Even though um, there are a few common denominators like the diabetes follow-up, the blood pressure, maybe pain, um, and women's health, there's a lot of different stuff in between. So I could go, they could go from having a two-year-old with constipation to then a 67-year-old with knee pain because she fell and um, she fell this morning and her knee is hurting. And so we had to go into a little bit of over and urgent care um, to uncontrolled blood sugars, um, chest pain. We've had several patients that we have to send to the hospital for an, what seems like an active MI. Um, so it gets up there. That's what I was saying that sometimes I cuted the patients because we are there like these patients have been coming here for the longest time and especially now with the pandemic and the fear that people have to go to the hospital um they can be dying and they just they won't go to the hospital that's, that's a problem that we're seeing and so somehow they feel you know safer coming to a clinic and um we've had a good number of patients with with active mi or like chf decompensation that you know we have to send to the hospital um or rash or stitches. And there's a lot of different diagnoses that we see. So I am definitely getting a lot of variety, yeah. All right, that's good to know. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Gabby, uh, I wanna say that um, we wrote down one other comment that we put on there that I, I wanna read it to you. And, and one of our listeners says, Gabby, I aspire to be a PA like you. So I, what a great compliment. So uh, congratulations so on much. a marvelous, marvelous talk. Yeah. Gabby, oh, if thank I you so might, much Rohit, you want to tell us about the... Oh, sorry, one, one last deal, Gabby. I just wanted to thank uh, you um, from the bottom of our heart. We, um, we are big into primary care and without good primary care, our healthcare system breaks down. So people like you keep this thing going. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts uh, for all the work that you do on the front lines. Thanks. We'll keep doing our best. All right. So for the quest-based information, uh, this was mentioned briefly earlier, but if you're unable to take download the certificate for the session and you took the assessment on a laptop or desktop, maybe try retaking it on your phone because a couple of students have found that this helps them get the certificate. If this still doesn't work, Feel free, to chat, uh, feel free to email us at virtualshadowing at gmail.com and that way we can confirm your hours. And on the last slide will be the quest base information for this assessment. So here you have the pin and the password for this session. So you'll go to questbase.com and where it says find assessment, you'll put in the pin. And when it asks for the password, that'll be G-A-B-Y, all lowercase. And you'll have until the beginning of the next session to complete this assessment. Sorry, Gabby DeVita, thank you so much. What a, what a wonderful talk. It, you just warmed our hearts tonight. You had 600 people just listening and loving everything that you said. You told us a story where by using your smarts, you saved a man's life. And th that's just a heartwarming story. I, I hope you see all the thank yous that are pouring into chat right yeah. now. So thank you. Thank again, you Gabby, so much for having me. This was great. <laughs>
And, and thank you guys for, for doing, again, helping out the students. Um, I know that if I was in their shoes right now, I would be so appreciative of this opportunity because it's so hard, you know, to have students um, shadowing and on more in-person opportunities right now. So this is amazing. <laughs> Happy to be a part of it. Thank you, Gabby. And thank you all to the virtual shadowing working group. Uh, they work hard all week long to put these together for you. And if, if you keep coming back, folks, we're going to be here. So um, we look, look forward to these uh, sessions every week. We love your wonderful questions and comments. And so it's an important week coming up. Take your vaccine if it's offered. Uh, wear your mask. Keep your distance. And above all, study hard because uh, it, in the end, uh, what matters is remembering that medicine is the art of compassion. And that's mm -hmm. what you want to be, a compassionate provider who is dedicated to the improvement of humanity. Thanks, everybody.